we've got Jay. <laughs> Jay came back like Sting. He was like, I'll do two. I will do the original, and I will come back like Sting from the Raptors for the 2003 remake because I love it so much. He's Texas gonna do Chainsaw two. Massacre. He's going to do two. 2003. Hey, man. Uh, I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, it's probably... It's up there with one of the best remakes of, of all time. It really is. Mm. I mean, it's up there with one of the best remakes of a horror uh, character of all time franchise. I mean, I think Friday the 13th of 2009 was incredible. I think it's un, uh, you know unheralded. I think it's one of those movies that no, you know, that nobody gives the respect that it's due. Or, uh, and um, I'll give it to Rob Zombie's Halloween was good, except for the first 25 minutes of this. This movie is, I think, it might be better. It might be the best one. It might be the best one. And I think I'm giving at least 0.5 points because of Jessica Bill's boobies. Holy hell. And her butt. But Holy nonetheless, hell. I think it's incredible. I think it really is a really enjoyable movie. Now, I will say right off the bat, the original one made me feel nasty and dirty when I watched it, kind of like Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. I feel like the first, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre is creepier because the way that it was shot and the way that it was filmed and the way, you know, it just made me feel kind of like, Oh God, damn, I got to yeah. put soap in my butt. It felt uh, like it was really happening. Yeah. yeah. But this one, while it didn't make me feel as nasty and, and more uh, grossed out as I felt after watching the original one, this one still is a very enjoyable cleaned up. I know it's hard to say because there's a lot more grossness in this, but a lot more cleaned up uh, version of Texas, more of a, popcorn uh texas chainsaw massacre but still fun <clears throat> and still it's still exciting yeah you know what they did with this dude they they took that movie and like that original movie which was exactly what you said it was disconcerting it made you feel disgusting it, mm -hmm. it was it was an awful place to spend I was having hour. sex with my ex again it was really <laughs> bad <laughs> it was an awful space yeah. to spend an hour and a half but that's what made it a great horror movie and they took all that and they took it and they they it's what a remake really should be like yeah. they took all that and they made it a watchable um horror movie that didn't make you feel like you really 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 needed a shower but you might need a shower after you watched it and they yeah. made it pretty and they made it uh beautiful and they took out some of the bad stuff i mean it's everything a remake should be and we we did the uh friday night fights when we did the best 2000s horror remake and yeah. it won and it yeah. should have won uh i love the friday the 13th 2009 reboot as well by the way same director same director uh marcus nispel yeah and this uh, was his first one yeah and it's crazy dude like let's look at this dude's filmography uh the guy uh let's look oh damn he's done a fucking bunch he's a music video guy that's so what that's what, that's that's what, what roger point. ebert was uh, uh was uh well he didn't make fun of him but he was like this guy's known for his music videos not his filmmaking ability but that's what platinum dunes did and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't they had a very like uh, a regimen style way of making these movies nightmare on elm street <laughs> ironically the guy who did the nightmare on elm street remake is the yeah. same dude who directed the blink 182 stay together for the kids video they mm. take these music video dudes and they and they give them a shot to see what they could do it was just something they were doing at the time platinum dunes but what i think is yeah. funny is michael bay can literally tell people to suck his optimus prime dick since he was the producer of this and he was the one that brought in <clears throat> andrew uh what's his love why well, can't never a uh, brzezinski or Br the one that played leatherface he's the one that brought him in yeah, uh, and, and, and without Brian, without Platinum Arch Dunes, it never would have happened. Yeah, and like Platinum Dunes did some good shit. Like I know it's a, it's a very money based thing. I do my money dance, but it was a very like they they did some good shit. This guy, his first movie directed like ever, like full time uh, off of the share music videos and Brian Adams music videos was this movie in two thousand three. And yeah. then you go to um, he did a TV movie for Frankenstein in two thousand four. He did a movie called Pathfinder, which was directed DVD. I'm pretty sure. I remember seeing that that that. Uh, dvd at walmart all the time and yeah. then he did friday the 13th he did the conan the barbarian remake which man, that's a which one with the rock uh uh no i don't think so it was no, that, the one with the rock was was good no that was hercules i'm thinking of a different one never mind yeah this hercules. he he did the one with uh this dude uh, oh, no jason terrible. jason know, yeah. momoa jason yeah. momoa that was a big sack uh, of shit. I remember damn, that, that cast was good, by the way. Rachel Nichols, Rose McGowan, Stephen Lang, Ron. Yeah, Perlman. no, they had a great cast. It was just a shitty movie. It was a garbage yeah. fire. But the funny thing is, he did a movie called Exeter, which I think I reviewed on the channel like a long fucking time ago uh, when I was doing the Redbox reviews, the shitty trash-ass exorcism movie that sucked butt cheeks uh, that felt kind of like a Rob Zombie horror movie. But anyways, 
he hasn't directed a movie since 2015. Like, well, and you know, what's also interesting is the writer of the movie. This was his first professional movie he ever wrote. Yeah, the screenwriter. Like, and and like they did a good job. Like, you know what I mean? But it's just this. The whole Platinum Dunes air is just wild, dude. Because they did a good job. Like the Amityville Horror remake was good. Like they did a good job. With well, that's the, the guy that, that that wrote this movie wrote the Amityville Horror remake. And the other thing is, the other thing is that Platinum Dunes was literally, that was the whole point, that Michael Bay wanted to start a company that would do low-budget horror movies, and the first thing that he wanted to do was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It was only a nine point, like I said, like a 9.3, 9.8 million dollar budget, but it made 106 million dollars worldwide. It's also interesting if you, uh, just, uh, you know, you can really get on these fucking Wikipedia kicks and you start looking up shit. Yeah. The one thing that was weird is that uh, they all, they originally hired, um, uh, toby hooper to come in uh to write the fucking movie and then for whatever yeah. reason it fell apart and he couldn't he, he wouldn't do it but they did he was supposed to have something to do with several of the movies and backed out at the end yeah but they also but they did keep the original cinematographer from the movie from the first texas chainsaw massacre they mm -hmm. kept that guy he was the one that did the cinematography for the first one and they and he said uh they you know people asked him why didn't you do it in the same way and he's like i'd already done that before so i didn't want to and, and the director was uh, reflecting this they didn't want to make a shot for shot exact same movie as the original TCM in 73. So they wanted to do their own unique uh, storytelling uh, visual of it. And they did a good job. And that's what I like about it. Because if you want to go back and look at like a turd that tried to do it shot for shot with Psycho with Vince Vaughn, right. literally the same fucking movie. Pointless. And that's why nobody Pointless. liked it. Yeah. Uh, so. Some some good stuff from the chat here, too, by the way. Tom Ungurian says, I'd put the Hills Have Eyes remake up there. That was fire. That was. That shit was fucked up. That Hills know. Have Eyes remake was gnarly. And I love this era of horror films where they would release these nasty, mean, gnarly horror films. And then you would get the DVD. I think everybody remembers this if we were yeah. alive then. Like, you get the DVD that was like the unrated version of the mm. Hills Have Eyes or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The super, super unrated version. It's if an, you touch this box, you'll bleed. Yeah, <laughs> it's, an, it's an unheralded, underappreciated time in horror. Like, we had the scream time, and then I think we had the, the 2000s where it was these remakes and these, like, let's get mean again with horror. Uh, but, uh, and also... Also, uh, who who the fuck said uh, Mark Dorman said Michael Bay was a music video director. So maybe that's why he wants to give these music video director shots because he owns Platinum Dunes, for those that don't know. And also, uh, Corn Pone Flicks makes a good point. Fincher did music videos, too. So there's something to be said. Sometimes it works. The guy who directed Nightmare on Elm Street, Samuel Bayer, did not work, obviously. Mm -hmm. But with Marcus Dispel, it, Dispel it, it did work. This is a great fucking horror movie, dude. By the way, if I'm saying, if because uh, I think JT Custom says... Uh, 1974 okay so tcm the original is 74 i was off by a year but okay so 74 instead of 73 but the only reason why i'm saying 74 is because i, I read the uh the uh the, the roger ebert um movie review and it was like january 74 so i thought the movie uh, came out in 73 eh. either way um not that big of a deal um yeah the thing about the remake is is uh, i think that what they did what what they what they did was that they enhanced what was really uh, well and good about the original movie rather than taking away from it and trying to change it and trying to change it. And like what Rob Zombie did in Halloween two is basically butt fuck Michael Myers and say, now you're going to take it. You're going to take right. it. And you're going to like it. And I'm going to make babies out of his butthole. And you're like, what? <laughs> it's just weird shit. What they did was like, no, we respect the material. We love the material. The writer that came on board, the director kid that came on board, they said, Hey, we respect what TCM 73 is all about. And we just want to enhance that. And that's what they did. I think they they just enhanced what it, what it was already at the core. What Roger mm -hmm. Ebert had a problem with, based on his two reviews, because he praised two out of four stars the original seventy three uh, TCM, is that it was a, a good, a very visceral type of movie that no one had really seen before, and kind of made you you know feel uncomfortable, and it was it was terrifying. What he hated about the remake, the zero out of four stars that he gave it, was that he said that it was mean for no reason that it played on gore and uh, meanness without any kind of context. He just had a bad day that day. Well, He's no, he said, it, well, he said he was celebrating. I think what he was trying to celebrate, it was celebrating um, hopelessness. Like it was just, there was no hope. And I was like, well, I mean, yeah. did we watch two different movies though? Cause TCM 73 was pretty hopeless too. It was the same thing. I mean, she yeah. lost all of her fucking friends and she's like wacko. Now yeah. when she's on the back of the truck, being like, I'm going to be a John Deere supermodel one day. Yeah. Like same that's, thing. Well, and you know, it's really, 
it's uh, I don't know. So I'm not gonna like Roger Eber, you know, uh, God rest his soul, he's passed on. So I'm not gonna like you know go after his critic review mm-hmm. on it. But I'm just saying it's kind of mm-hmm. interesting that you're gonna give it the, the what the, the subject the 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 baseline the TCM 73 a two out of four and literally which it was yeah. rare for Roger Eber to give it a zero out of four and say it was literally no need for it was mean for no reason I, I disagree with that i think he was just having a bad day when he went to the city well no i mean day. you know yeah. i would have said the same because he you listen to this he gave day of the dead like he fucking sh- shit all over it when day of the dead came out george romero's classic day of the dead he came out yeah. later on and said i need to revisit this movie this movie was actually really good i think that if if uh roger eber had survived i think he might have come back to the movie and praised it yeah for what it uh, did blu-ray addict said it right he said ebert could be harsh on horror films and he could he would have those times where he would be really harsh on horror films but this film in itself like what i appreciate the most out of this movie is two things number one they took away like i love the original texas chainsaw massacre film i, I it's not a great space it's not a great time to spend watching that movie but no. it is an it has its place in horror because you go back and you watch that movie and you you are scared you don't mm-hmm. feel comfortable yeah. it's everything a horror movie technically if people look at horror movies in a certain light it's everything a horror movie is supposed to be with texas mm-hmm. chainsaw massacre but with this movie what they did was they they my two favorite things is a they they focused on leatherface a little bit and like none of these movies and I'm, I'm halfway through the franchise right now none of these movies did that like they all wanted to go oh we got to do the family and we got to do the dinner table scene yeah. this remake had the balls the fucking balls to not do the dinner table to not redo that same shit that these non yeah. remakes, these sequels they were, had done. Yeah, I think they, they were hyper aware of that. They did not want to recreate scenes. Yeah, and they did a great job of it. They, they did, did a couple a of bit, them. They did a couple yeah, of them with the door slam, yeah. or the sledgehammer, like the right times. But I think they picked their spots really nicely, yeah. and they replaced. They took away the dinner table scene, and it's just the awful time you spent sitting at that dinner table watching her scream nonstop. We didn't have to do that. This time they replaced him with a fucking legendary actor in R. Lee Embry as Sheriff Hoyt. Dude, uh, I think he's he better than so the, the original. Scary. I think he's yeah. better than the original. And I and I know that's uh, that's sacrilege and that's blasphemy for a lot of fans of TCM. But I, I do like R. Lee Embry a lot. I think he's a, an awesome actor or he was an awesome actor. It was it was extremely underrated. He was a great uh, in full metal jacket. And I feel like he fit this part perfectly. And uh, it was weird because uh, I was watching this with April and she was like, you know, I, I didn't I didn't really get scared, but it was kind of like she was frightened of him. You know, I, I felt like he he He's put more scary. fear into people as that character than the original did in TCM 73. So I, I but, so I feel like for that reason alone, like I feel like he was just uh, he, was <laughs> he, was perfect, kind of, he was a perfect home run uh, guy for the role. Perfect. He was home also run cast. He was also funny at times too. Yeah. He's like, he's like, go on, pick her up, shake him, bite you. She's deader than a goddamn like, doornail. <laughs> like, that's pretty funny. He's like, do that body. Up. He had saran wrap and or yeah, like Reynolds wrap, and he was like, I cut me a little feel right there. <laughs> like, touch your titty. I was like, he's like, she's a little wet down there. What do you boys do? You know, at the same that time, was, was very thinking, was Rob like, Zombie ish. Like, by the yeah, way, dude, I was, thinking, I was like, this is fucking Rob Zombie's family. Like, yeah. There is no way that this is not. But yeah, dude, there's something about that movie. I feel like is is extremely special. And by the way, the the guy that played Leatherface in this, uh, reading about him a little bit, uh, he was he was like, he, we just did Batman Returns. It's like, go, Dad, save yourself. Go, Dad, go. He was Chip. He was Chip <laughs> from Batman Returns, which is so fucking crazy. It was Chip, and yeah. uh, apparently he he was friends with Michael Bay. Uh, because they had worked, uh, I didn't know this either, and I was like, "Holy shit!" I remember that he was uh, Joe the Boxer in Pearl Harbor, which is uh, where who uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. fought on the yeah. on the on the Navy ship. He's got but he asked ass Michael, career. yeah, he's a big motherfucker too. He's got big giant jaw. But he asked Michael Bay, he's like, "Hey, I'd love to be Leatherface." And Michael's like, "Yeah," but the guy that they hired originally got hospitalized and then got fired for fucking lying about his physical abilities. So I guess he couldn't. He probably said, "I'm a stunt man, y'all." And then he, he did the first day of work and got a broken leg. He's like, you're fired. So they hired this guy. They hired uh, Andrew. He he said he uh, gained up to 300 pounds. And then they put a fat body suit on him. So he was weighing 420 pounds. And then he had a silicone mask on in 85 degree weather that he couldn't breathe through. Dude, Van Thomason just said he was also the metalhead in Any Given Sunday. I remember yeah. that. He's the dude with the gigantic cock in Any Given Sunday, I think. Mm. 
holy shit, that guy's got a weird career. And but I that, but that dude, I, I tell you what, he 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 like he nailed it, man. Like and and it was a perfect cast and big motherfucker. He's six foot five. Then the time that movie came out, he got up to three hundred pounds. He was six foot five with three hundred pounds. Then they put a fat suit on him, so he was four twenty at six foot five. You have to be that big to carry that suit around. You yeah. talk about a hundred and twenty pound fucking fat suit running around chasing hot ass bitches like Jessica Biel, <laughs> but you know at the same time he probably didn't have to worry about because his dick was leading him the entire time. But at the same time, <laughs> it's crazy. But here's the thing: uh, I do know there was some controversy with him. I didn't know all this, but I looked this up and I was like, Holy between shit. him and Gunnar Hansen, oh yeah, yeah, because apparently after Gunnar Hansen died, he said boo hoo on Facebook. But then when you find out what happened, he said that Gunnar Hansen had been talking shit on him at cons and stuff and he's like yeah it sucks that he had pancreatic cancer because i never wished him dead i didn't say i wanted him dead i just said he could suck my nuts because of what he you know he talked shit on me that's what he was saying but he said yeah it sucks that he had pancreatic cancer he said you guys can read into that how you want to read into it because he said when i said boohoo i never hashtagged anybody i never called anybody out but you all have a nice day so basically what he's saying is like hey man i took over the role i played uh leatherface in the tcm 03 and then in tcm the beginning and then apparently Gunnar Hansen, I don't know if this is true, or I don't know, but had gone in when he was at cons because he, uh, Gunnar Hansen redid the, uh, he took the role back up later on mm -hmm. and was talking shit on him. And because he said he was always cool with him. And then all of a sudden he's talking shit on him, you know, to fans and stuff. And I guess he got pissed because he basically what uh, that Andrew guy was like saying, he's like, I'm not going to listen to your, you know, you rattle your mouth off. Yeah. And, and not have a response. But, Either way, so that was what that you know, it's kind of shitty for him that it followed him around. And I, I think, and I'm not saying this is 100% true, but I think that's probably what prevented him from ever catching the role again. Yeah. I mean, because they're like, like, well, we can't really hire you right now because, you know, because you yeah. and Gunner got into it. So, hey, you play be... stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Yeah. But yeah. That, like all that being told, he's a great leather face. And he was like, and he was the, really big, the mask, yeah. the mask. It's one of the best masks. Like it looks great. And there's really multiple good. masks in this, by the way. I love the mask switches. When he kills off, what's the do? Uh, Kemper. When he kills off Eric Balfour's character, Kemper, and he, he you see him like, thinking like oh, my face your face my face your face <laughs> he puts his face on and dude yeah. when when she looks at him and she's wondering where kemper was and he turns around and that like shit's falling around him and like the camera zooms in the cinematography in this film is fucking great but that's the guy that did the uh, the original one that's responsible for all that yeah yeah and it's great like they did an amazing job but when that yeah. camera zooms in on him and he's like oh yeah, that was fucking scary. Was really dude. good. Yeah, that was, was really fucking good. frightening. And I like nightmare that. material. Scary. That was amazing. I'm gonna change my battery on my camera and hope it doesn't fuck okay. up. This time. Okay, you do that. I I like the part where he was sitting out in the hallway, and he was listening to I guess his mother like a talk you know talk shit on Jessica Biel and 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 and, and kind of you know argue with uh, Arlie Emery, uh, his character, and um, he's just sitting out in the hallway like a kid, like he knows that. Like it felt like I remember those days, like when your mom had company over and you had maybe had just got your report card in the day before and you'd got a D or a couple of F's or something. And your mom was telling her friends about, oh, honey, I was just so upset. That boy got an F in gym. And all you got to do is run around. And he got an F in gym. He just sat there like lazy bones and didn't want to do nothing. Didn't even want to play basketball. And she's telling all of her friends about it. And you're like, fuck. The way that Leatherface was sitting out in the hallway like that, and like he's like, I gotta go in though. And she's like, get in here. I was like, shit. <laughs> like I, I, I felt that was really, uh, you know, funny. But I, I feel like what uh, Andrew, um, I'm, I, I'm literally, gonna, I cannot remember his last name. Uh, uh, it's a Berinsky. Brian Niarski. Brian Niarski. Brinoski. I feel like what he did was he brought a, a different type of. Um, characterization to that character that really didn't have any before much the same way as kane hotter did in new blood like he mm. brought a different type of uh i don't know just the way that he moved and his eyes and and the way that he presented himself maybe not as extreme as kane, kane hotter really did change the game with jason but yeah. like in that same level like he actually took leatherface and made him a little bit more uh animated yeah uh and, and like you know like he, he he fucking nailed the role like you know given whatever 
whatever he went through and all that shit was going on. He was a great leather face. And like, I, dude, I think that this entire fucking movie just, it had some annoyances. It had some of those typical remakes that like, okay, this character's annoying and we got to get through this and blah, blah, blah. And like the chase scene at the end, it's very weird. Like these movies all have their own playbook. But like the chase scene at the end was a little bit long between Leatherface and Jessica yeah. Biel, and it went on and on and on. They did the same thing with Rob Zombie's Halloween, and they made him go back and reshoot to make the chase scene between him and Laurie at the end of that movie longer. Yeah. And it's almost like verbatim the same thing here. The only problem I have with that chase scene, I thought it was really good when they go back to the meat factory or whatever, and they're doing that whole thing right. Mm-hmm. But do you think honestly, like when she pops out of that locker and she hacks his arm off? Do yeah. you think she could have really just hacked his arm off with a butcher knife like that, just real quick, like three strikes? I mean, it, his arm it depends falls on off. the amount of steroid injection she had done at the gym earlier that day. She did I have strong butt cheeks, but she like, did. I mean, she I pulled know. all the like, power from the butt cheeks and the legs. I don't. <laughs> that's but well, awesome. the thing is, I first of all, I thought that was stupid. Uh, yeah, she's not. You know, I'm not saying that you couldn't do that. I don't know. I've not really hacked someone's arm off with the, uh, you know, at the arm in at least two years, so I'm I can't remember. But I do think it was kind of a stretch. But also, I don't like the whole baby thing to it. I know it's supposed to add the creepy element, but I just feel like it's. I was like, all right, let's just. I'm not saying like let's redo the exact ending that the because that was what they wanted to avoid. They did not want to do the exact same right. ending. And I appreciate. And I get that. it. I get it. But there is something. Um, even Rob Zombie acknowledged that ending in in some way when michael wakes up at the end of uh halloween rob zombie's halloween and then you just see a splatter of blood so like he looked like he was dead and then he's not so even he acknowledged because in the original halloween he gets shot a hundred times and then falls off the balcony and then he disappears in this one it's kind of the same way in the in the remake of, of rob zombies where he looks like he's dead but in the in, but the, the difference is that she gets on top of him and then she has the gun to his face and we don't know i don't yeah. know but I feel like in this one they could have done like I feel like cut out the the baby thing, um, cut out some of the more drawn out chase, uh, the meat packing plant, mm-hmm. and you got a you got a fucking winner winner chicken dinner. But Cheers, other folks, than that, we're over four hundred, only four hundred people wow. here at nine fifty one p.m. Eastern. Oh, all, I just want all of you guys to know that each and every one of you have wonderful, wonderful faces, and I wish I could kiss them all. As long as you're of the age of 18 and older. I'm a licky. But yeah, so like, and that's what this movie is. So my favorite part, though, of this entire movie, though, apart from the zoom ins on Jessica Biel uh, up and down uh, when Mm, (laughs) he even like, I like that. They not only do they put her in a wife beater and like tie her shirt together, but Leatherface throws her in a, in a wet. Well, I like when she's running up the field toward the house and they literally (laughs) zoom in on the, on on her cakes. Yeah, that camera was like, like so like, close. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a, you know, and she was good in the movie. Uh, but like, my favorite thing about this though was just watching Leatherface do his thing. Like, he the zoom ins, like the the way that he would run around, the way that they shot him, and they show him maskless when he's built when he's yep. cutting the mask up. He takes off his mask, and it was crazy to see, dude. His nose is cut off, and he's just like. Oh, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that, that was that, cool. That probably was the um, Cocahina. No, that was probably the autopsy picture of Michael Jackson. <laughs> In the same stream, you love a man and degrade him all at once. Because I love him, I can degrade him. <laughs> but he was joke, scary. Guys. He's been dead for a while. It, it was, you know, I'm just saying, like, the, all they said was like Michael Jackson's nose popped off like a Mr. Potato Head nose. <laughs> When they were working finally, on fi- I felt like I felt like this was a fan's film for TCM because like, number one, they took away the really annoying retread that this this franchise really has a bad problem with. They all want to do the same thing. They want to take the attention off of Leatherface mm-hmm. and not and, and they want to show the family sitting around the dinner table, do the same thing the original did with Grandpa. Grandpa is a one hitter. Like, well, they added they- to the family in this one. They did, but it wasn't the same. Like they did, they at least did something different. They put the focus on Leatherface finally. Mm-hmm. And when the focus wasn't on Leatherface, it was on uh, Arlie Emery or Ermy. Uh, but Ar- like, Ernie, yeah, he's so fucking good at work. He was he's scary. amazing, dude. Charismatic he had a, as fuck. He had a funny games vibe to him. Like, if you've ever seen the movie Funny Games, like it's it's one of the most uncomfortable. Like, dude, mm-hmm. when he sits him in that car and he puts the gun in his mouth, like I was so scared. Like, well, fucking- because you know what the thing about. Uh, Arlie Armory or Emory. I, I don't know how you guys want to say his last name, but 
he has such a charismatic presence about him when he's on screen. I think that he's he you never know like with the because he's I mean obviously he's an actor, but he's got such a such a way about him that when you see him on screen, like he does give you that like unsure like they could literally take this motherfucker anywhere and I'll have no idea except for the fact that I pooped my pants because I was scared. <laughs> like look yeah. at uh you know and I think the most wondrous job he ever did was Full Metal Jacket. Obviously that was his bread and butter you know that was where he came from you know he was a drill sergeant for real but yeah dude like he's such a great actor and i'm glad they added and again he's my favorite uh he's he's the best sheriff uh and i and i include that with tcm 73 and i know that's sacrilege to some people but he's better uh, he's better than the guy that played him in 73 like i mean this he added a whole different dimension to the to the movie yeah, that they he, didn't really have in the in the first one and by the yeah. way, the little boy in this, the one with the you know Buck Two Charlie, dude, do you know that kid is? That kid's from the kid from Darkness Falls. If you turn off the lights, she'll get that. Me. Makes perfect fucking sense. That, was that him. makes perfect fucking sense. Yeah, because uh, I saw his fucking weird eyes that he looks like that like he's been either smoking crack or not had a good night's sleep in eighteen years. And he was like, <laughs> I was like, I know that child. He's from Darkness Falls. <laughs> and and yeah, not just that dude, but like he that so how how mean Leatherface was in this. Like he cuts off dude's leg. Mm -hmm. He cuts his leg clean off. That that scene when he's running through the sheets was scary as shit. Like yeah, the chase scenes with cool, Leatherface yeah. were so good. The first dude that he sledgehammers was so good. Like everything with Leatherface was so damn good and it was shot so perfectly. He's so you big. Just, you don't, yeah, and you just don't get that with horror movies. Like, there's so many horror movies out there. Halloween Four, for example, where they've got these cool scenes built up, and they're just not shot right. When you watch this movie, they put Leatherface in the perfect light, and he's scary. He in the perfect. He's just they nailed fucking Leatherface, man. Yeah, really and it's did. the same thing we say about Halloween 2018. Some people don't like it for this or that, but they got Michael Myers right, and that's not as easy as it, as you would think it would be. So many movies fucked up their own good storylines and good ideas by not getting the main character right. And this is one of the few Texas Chainsaw Massacre films that actually gets Leatherface right. And yeah. not only does he cut that dude's leg off, but he puts fucking salt in it, and he puts the dude on... Like, the shit that he did was gnarly. This was a scary-ass Leatherface, man. Yeah. I, I don't I, I think I, I definitely think he was a lot more intimidating uh than the the original TCM uh Leatherface and I, I I feel like he was a lot more as far as like this big brutal killer uh that hacks off your face and wears it like it's a goddamn mask it you know that they bought at JC Penny is exactly the kind of guy that um Andrew I guess his fucking last name always eludes me Andrew um, uh the the guy that uh Brian Niarski. I'm gonna. Brian you know what? It's a hard to say name. I'm. I'm just gonna start calling him Chip from Batman Returns. <laughs> but what fucking Chip did was great. Um. But yeah, man, I, I think that uh, the the TCM 03 overall, I I feel like it's it's a solid movie. It's worth uh, it's worth a check out. If you guys, and you know there are. I mean, I'm not saying there's a lot, but I mean there are. I'm sure a few people that are purists and they won't watch it because it's not in line with what tcm as far as like what their version of tcm should be but you guys should do yourself a favor and watch this because the director of this film does a lot better than what you would imagine a music director would do what he does is he takes his background in music directing and just applies it with a lot more of a beefier type of script and and the way that he shoots it versus letting it define him and like rob zombie did in halloween 2 and have a fucking white unicorn run around I don't know, and and you know, <laughs> fucking Cherry Moon fucking it while she's riding it, and then have Guns and Roses playing somewhere. Like what this guy does is he's like, hey, you know what? I have I have a background in music videos, and this is what I do. So I understand like how to how to film certain quick shots and do certain things. But I'm gonna let that be a defining, not a de not a defining moment, but a a a, a background piece that I can use to utilize a better filmmaking technique in my direction of TCM. And that's what he does. I, I, I think it's written well. I think it's, I think it's directed well. The, the cinematography, I don't think you can argue with it. It's the guy that did the, the, the 73 TCM, same guy, same exact guy. Uh, the, the cast is good. The only thing that was weird. I was like, you know, the guy that was, um, uh, um, from kingdom J the guy that, that plays the, the brother in this one with the glasses, Jonathan Tucker. 
Yeah. I feel like he should have been in a wheelchair. I, I don't feel like they should have strayed from that. I think that whole thing is fucking terrifying is the fact that he was in a wheelchair and like he couldn't. That's like a good there was, point. There was no way he could get away. Like his there was nothing scene, he could do. His death scene was cool, though, when he picks no, him I up loved his death scene. His on death the scene chandelier yeah. and then like does him that way. Uh, and then the beginning of this, too. We got to talk about that uh, before we're done. The beginning, I like the way they 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 subverted uh, in like expectations with the beginning. When the girl yeah. gets in the car. And she sits at the back and she's like, you're all going to die. They did it quick. They didn't let it linger on and go on and on and on. And they didn't try to do the same thing at all. I mean, she does pull a gun out of her vagina, which is a little God, like, damn. But it sets the fucking tone. I mean, that's a tone set. That's you true. want to start a movie with someone pulling a gigantic goddamn revolver? That's when I pulled out my it's like, revolver. So I guess the night we're going to fucking Waffle House. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, how would you oh. not smell that? When Woo! she walked, like, how did she prison wallet that? Like, I know a prison wallet's your butthole, but for a girl, it would be their fucking. I, I know but she fit a fucking revolver in her vagina. <laughs> if they wanted like to that, do shit it. had to be looser than the fucking Chicago, like, goddamn uh, highways or, or the, the tunnels. They could have done it. They could have just made if they want to make it real gr gross, they could have just done a like a. <laughs> noise or see some like juices come off of it and like and, and they her, her they vagina must have been like, like when you do a parachute when you were kids in, in gymnasium oh. when you do the when everybody gets around and they they throw up the the fucking parachute her <laughs> yeah. vagina must have been that wide oh it's so bad dude <laughs> yeah she like, could probably fit an ak that? in that bitch you want me to stick this into my heart she pulled that giant gun out of her vagina and but that scene was so gnarly that dude. was gnarly like, yeah that's not the scene like we didn't ex we didn't need that kind of greatness but like when she shoots she blows her head out like and then the camera veers out through the hole in the back of the thing and they that did it good. like twice that was so cool like that was shot was so cool it this director a this cinematographer the the lighting crew the, that gigantic house in the middle of the woods when Jessica Biel's walking up to it or when they're fighting or whatever, like, yeah, it's a beautiful goddamn film. And it really and is shot well. There's the, no doubt. one more thing the opening and the ending were great. Where they had the uh, they had the, the police officers, like, oh, this yeah, is, that was you great. see yeah. some nails and you yeah. see the scratches here. That was good. And then the way that they ended it was just a fucking chef. The only kiss. known footage of the of leatherface and he was like Ugh. and how <laughs> fucking scary was it looks he, like it looked like your dog when you're trying to take a picture of your dog but it moves suddenly it's like <laughs> and it's all blurry <laughs> <laughs> but how scary was that like that last cool, shot yeah. that got leatherface i was like hey, stick it. you know like when that like he looks like he's coming out of a fucking pool and he's got like boogers in his nose and he's like sure. yeah he that looks was like your dad when you ask him for twenty dollars if you could borrow twenty dollars <laughs> yeah. like or, yeah or, <laughs> when you wake up your dad because you're skipping school and it's Argh! uh so so good man so good so i the movie to me is an 8.5 it's it's one of the best remakes yep. ever it's one of the best the best 2000s horror remake of all of them and goddamn they finally nailed leatherface since the original after all these movies they fucking gave us the leatherface that horror fans slasher fans wanted we wanted a movie about goddamn leatherface chasing some motherfuckers and they gave it to us yeah, it's right? an 8.5 for me, too. I, I'm I, Like I said, I said earlier on, uh, what they did right was the fact that they just enhanced what the original brought. The TCM-73, they just enhanced it. They didn't take away from it. They didn't try to make it a completely different type of movie as far as, like, changing the actual heart of the movie. They kept that the same. They just enhanced the overall story with great acting, a great script, a great direction, and great music as well. And I think overall, I got to be honest, like, Gunnar Hansen is, like, a, he's a legend definitely but this dude that that you know he brought a lot of uh thunder pants to leatherface that we'd never seen before uh and and he was he was very intimidating the fact that this guy was a six foot five 300 pound dude already then they put a fat suit on him and make him 420 fucking pounds and now he's six foot five and he's got a goddamn chainsaw holy shit you better pay your bill at cracker barrel because that's what he looked like. He looked like a mad ass <laughs> fucking cook from Cracker Barrel coming out there with a spatula and a chainsaw. Or and some that we've actually up. seen at but yeah, dude. House. And I, you know, and I was like, yeah, and it was just it was just a really, really incredible movie. And I I'm I'm just it's one of those movies that it's really impressive that Michael Bay, of all people, is the producer of it, just like he's mm -hmm. the producer of the check uh the uh Friday the 13th 09 remake. Yeah, and great it's thing incredible. Going, I wish they were still running super. Yeah, and so it's like, yeah, you could suck his Optimus Prime dick because he did a great job as far as producing these movies. Because I feel like what he did was, if if you know, I know he had some type of 
he's definitely had some type of voice in the production of the movie because he's a producer. But he was like, hey, you know what? I love the movies from when they, you know, when they originally came out. So I don't want to change too much. I just want to give maybe a suggestion or two. But let's mm. just keep the main, uh, the main omelet together. Like, I, like that's it. it I mean, it was it's a great fucking movie, man. Like, it it's makes, awesome. It makes you think, too. A lot of people think Rob Zombie would be the perfect person to remake TCM. But I actually think that this movie was the perfect amount of meanness Meanness mixed with good storytelling, mixed with great cinematography and great action scenes. Like I think Rob Zombie would have went just a step overboard. Well, just you know, it, it, unless Michael, unless Michael Bay was involved, Michael Bay, would be like, take your fucking like lice infested yeah. hair out of your my my face. And, and the chat was talking you. about it. And Vanessa, some people were talking about. Frank Vogel was the blonde dude uh, in this that got fucked up, and he was the main guy in Grind. So shout out that guy. Grind's a fucking amazing. That's a great movie. That's an underrated movie as well. Yeah. That's amazing. Sweet Lou cleans no Sweet man's Lou. poo.